as we gather on this Good Friday, I'd like to take you back more in biblical days to where a story was the major form of teaching, where scriptures were in the temples, but not by the individuals. So let's begin with the story in the garden. It's an early morning. The dew dampens the ground. It's a beautiful stream nearby. And here are various animals of all sizes that have come to fill their, their, their thirst, to quench their thirst from this unpolluted stream. There's a bear, a fox, a lion, a rabbit, birds of vibrant and various colors. They run, they play as, as though they were on a gymnastic team together, enjoying the warmth of the sun or the shade from the canopy overhead. The Creator, the gracious God, the Creator, has made this sp sprawling galaxies, flowers unequaled in beauty, stars that, that dot the sky, lanterns as it were, all life is held together by this gracious Creator. And the source of His life is love. It has been and always will be. And from this great love, He created humans. Again, various shapes and various sizes to live in His garden. That was His desire. We'll call them kings and queens. Invited to rule and to reign in His great kingdom. It was never his intention to be far removed. It was his desire, as we read, to walk with his king and queen. They were brought into the story to live, to obey, to enjoy a relationship with God, to enjoy this, this building together. And for a period of time, life was beyond anything our minds can grasp. And then one day, a forked tongue appeared. And a forked tongue began to ask questions. Does God really care about you? Is God really in charge? Why do you have to obey His rules? You're wise. Do what you want to do. And then came the accusation, God has lied to you. He is not good. He's withholding from you and you can do much better. And then the garden fell. But God cried out a message of goodness to this crumbling society. And the story didn't end. Another king will come, God proclaimed. And he will silence the forked tongue. And he will restore peace and relationship and his love will be dominant. But the rivers are now polluted. Toxins fill the air. Conflict sits with clenched fists as the kings and queens do their own thing. The lion devours the bear or, the, or the, the deer. Wasps sting. Forest fires burn across the land. Ashes, emptiness, barrenness, death, char. Thorns grow. Chaos abounds. The early task work that was a joy in the previous garden is now dull. It is boring. It's routine. It's the same. It's empty. Clash and conflict. And then there's decay. And there's death that was unseen in this original garden. The landscapes are filled with landfills, with rubbish, with waste, with cemeteries. The beautiful countryside has totally changed. The lion wets his lips with the blood of the deer. Corruption, abuse, chaos is the norm. And the Me First movement has begun. The Me First movement of all humanity. Just a few steps outside of the garden is abuse, is greed, is murder. In the garden, it's now thorns, it's barrenness. Fists are raised and words of accusation. God, why did you do this? 
What kind of God are you that would allow us to suffer like this? Why have you given us this terrible mess? The artist who created that first beautiful garden is more than just a creator. He is love. And from his acts, not like your acts and not like my acts, but from his acts, he didn't wipe the slate clean. No, he instituted a rescue plan. Come, let's put together the broken pieces. Let's bring wholeness to the barrenness. Let's bring life again, a purpose and goodness. I will not abandon the original plan, but from the voice of the Creator. Evil must be faced head on, but evil's roots run deep. And to eradicate them, Something drastic has to take place. God, so deeply in love with us, institutes His plan. Like visitors in a museum, we, click, we quickly glance and then we step back into our destructive mode in that me-first movement that I'm a part of and so are you. We pour buckets of hate and buckets of filth. We pour buckets of evil and buckets of ugliness upon God's creative work beauty. In our clawing others, in our search for more, to serve ourselves, we continually come to the throne of despair. God's desire is to destroy evil and to give us life. Evil must be dealt with. One day in human history, God made a vow, a tremendous vow. And because God has said, I love you, God has now said, I will rescue you and I'll redeem you and I'll make you mine. I will initiate a mission. I will initiate a plan to restore what the garden had been. I will make you mine. The time moved on. Another morning do on the ground as a reminder of what it had been in the garden. Sin entangles the would-be kings and queens who are now slaves. And to the altar every day a priest steps. And with a young lamb, he slits his throat and blood is spilt. And blood then is taken and poured through the temple to deal with the rebellion of the Me First movement, to deal with the sin of the Me First movement. A slaughter as a reminder that a cost must be paid for the evil that is within the hearts of the would-be kings and queens. In some way, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, should transform this lifeless animal, should transform the would-be kings and queens. But we continue to be dominated by our own Me First movement. Israel remembered vividly the great cost, the great cost of their sin, the fractured relationships, the fists that were raised, the evilness. And the priest walked through the temple door day after day. Day after day, he walked through the temple door, sprinkling blood as a symbol of life to wash away. And that cycle carried on, and it carried on, and it carried on. And there were more would-be kings and more would-be queens who ended in despair, but there was evil, and some evil was far deeper than other evil. But always there was suffering. Always there was sin. Always there was self. Always there was death. Eventually, like the first garden, Israel failed. They were only concerned with me first. Myself. Not the poor, not the needy, not those in despair. Soon the sacrifice was a ritual act, and no one seemed to care. Blood, but what was the reason? Blood, what was the cost? It was simply there. And God pleaded with the prophets. God pleaded with them. Remind the people, remind the people. A prophet named Isaiah said a king would come. And Isaiah tells us in chapter 53, who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, 
like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with our pains. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised. We held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pains and bore our sufferings. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. By his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he will not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who in this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. From the transgressions of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor had any deceit come from his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord made his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after he has suffered. He will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils among the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressions, for he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the righteous. But those words of Isaiah fell on deaf ears. Kings and queens lived in their own world. Kings and queens did their own desire. They were more into the me first movement themselves. And so they lived with no land, no king, no temple, broken people. Another morning in history, again, due on the ground, a reminder of the garden. And in a small corner, of an overrun nation, a messenger appeared to a teenage girl. And the messenger said, a, a king is coming and he will deal with the Me First movement. He will bring comfort and he will rescue. And his name is Jesus, God rescues. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. The king rescuer did not arrive as any normal king would. There was no flaming chariot. He arrived to a poor teenage girl in a cave. He grew and learned until the time to begin his rescue mission. And he did it not as a conqueror, but as a teacher. He wandered Israel with good news, with mercy, with healings, with kindness, with love with the truth of God, with empowering God. He forgave sins. He quieted storms. He restored life. And as in years earlier, the forked tongue appeared. And the forked tongue asked the question once again, does God have to be in charge? Why do we have to do things His way? Is God really good? Shouldn't we be able to rule ourselves? Aren't we wise enough? Don't we know enough? God is lying. And this man's an imposter. And so on a dark night, the Lord Jesus was taken. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was humiliated. He was whipped. He was insulted. He was spat upon. And naked. One hand was nailed to a cross beam. The other hand was nailed to a cross beam. His feet were impaled on the cross. 
He who was destined to be great and mighty was bare before all to see. There was no more king. Was this dream over? As the lion wet his lips with the blood of the deer, as the would-be kings and queens wet their lips with the blood of hate and bitterness and revenge, so the evil one that day, that night, wet his lips with the blood of the would-be king, the Messiah. His body was cut. And blood poured forth the cost of dealing with my me first movement, your me first movement, the debt, the guilt of humanity. All humanity was transformed at that sacrificial lamb. God did something because evil is costly. A lifeless body was wrapped. It was placed in a borrowed tomb. There's no king. There's no kingdom. The dream is gone. And that which was in the garden is now finished. It's over. The kingdom has come to an end. And on this night, the dream is finished. It's over.